2013 was a milestone year for hip-hop. Not only did it give us a beloved set of projects churned out by well-acclaimed perennials, it was also a year that hosted the breakout works of many up-and-comers that would eventually reach superstar heights in the industry today. Hallmark releases from Mac Miller, Tyler the Creator, and ASAP Rocky, as well as the album debuts of RTJ, French Montana, and many others heavily contributed to the aesthetic identity, as well as the sonic dimensions of hip-hop for the remaining years of the 2010s. What I believe to be the true creme de la creme of all the cream in 2013's hip-hop scene came from a scruffy, letterman jacket donning, 22-year-old kid from Southside Chicago. Chancellor Bennett, going by the name of none other than Chance the motherfucking rapper, was then best known for his impressive 2012 debut mixtape, 10 Day, titularly named after Chano's 10-day school suspension wherein he wrote the mixtape's first draft. He followed up on his phenomenon with the release of his now-beloved sophomore mixtape, Acid Rap. The 14-track project ran with an almost honey-like consistency as well as the lingering touch of youthful wooziness. The mixtape truly exemplified Chance's playful, carefree persona. Right from the THC-induced raspy riffs and spats, down to his quirky, signature ad-libs. In its every huh! and ah! It highlighted Chano's ability to collaborate excellently with a variety of feature artists, shelling out bangers with Vic Mensa, Twista, Donald Glover, and many others who all stood out well, outstandingly. I also give high regard to Chance's writing in this project, as it's stringed out like good mozzarella in this deep dish of a mixtape. But perhaps the most acidy asset of the project would come from the indelible, acid jazz infused production style of the album, engineered by the likes of Nate Fox, Brandon Deshay, and Ludwig Goranson. Acid rap contemplated on serious topics such as the ups and downs of drug use, Chance's relationship struggles, and basically growing up in the sometimes heartwarming but most times unforgiving streets of Southside Chicago under a rather cerebral, yet also lightheaded and dreamlike intimacy. The cult influence of this album alone is also something to look up to. I mean to this day, I'm pretty sure Cocoa Butter Kisses still remains a staple in everyone's Get High playlist even though no one wants to admit it. In fact, most people would agree that Acid Rap is still Chance's best work by far. You'd kinda understand seeing these opinions if only they came out in 2013 or back in 2016 at the release of Coloring Book. But it's already 2021, and much of the public's opinion surrounding what Chance's best body of work was by far has barely tipped, if any at all. This should lead anyone with a sane mind to wonder if there's something amiss with Chance's work post acid rap. Perhaps he flew too close to the sun, or perhaps he's just a victim of his own hype. Perhaps he cursed himself in declaring the words, I met Kanye West, now I'm never gonna fail. Was Chancellor Bennett destined to succumb to the problems he's experiencing now, or is his titanic fall merely a result of massive misfortune and maybe a hint of misfire on Chance's part? One look and we can see that the jovial, socially aware, and often jazz boom bap inspired seniors that Chance belongs to are few and far in between. A closer glance tells us that apart from a few standouts like Mac Miller, Logic, Macklemore, and Anderson Pack, Chance is arguably spearheading the current iteration of Goody Two Shoe rappers, and I think this distinction has worked both as a blessing and a curse, in the sense that Chano's brand as this joyous, god-fearing, corny dad type figure has created a joyous, god-fearing fanbase that only his product can fulfill and satisfy. The curse part, however, would fall on the concept of career structure and Chance's ability to plan for the future. A Western University study authored by Christopher R. White analyzes the careers of rappers and how they garner and maintain success for a certain period of time, finding that the most successful rappers are the ones who have gained the most of what is called cultural capital, which is basically clout based on how I understood it and can utilize that influence into something tangible and maybe cannibal into assets. You can read more about it in the link in the description below. Chances had the burden of converting the massive amount of cultural capital he has amassed in the past, with the success and acclaim from his free mixtapes into what is known as economical capital. Basically cash, money, the big bucks. On the other hand, as the head honcho of his lane, Chance was also at a chance to strike gold on some more cultural capital in carving a career path that's been rather unexplored and untouched. Chance does try to make amends with both choices in trying to upend the aforementioned curse. But let's see if it works out for him in the long run. 
2016 was another one of Chance's marquee years. He rediscovered his faith, which played a huge role in the themes of his Grammy Award winning mixtape and ad lib fest coloring book. While the earnest beauty of acid rap relied on Chance's way of cultivating nostalgia and reminisce, Coloring Book's ode to Chance's faith and devotion made the album welcoming and warm to the touch, and everyone was there to experience the glory. We also got to see Chancellor at the forefront of Kanye's The Life of Pablo in both performance and writing. His verse in Ultralight Beam was the feature that I believe at least for the hype of its time, canonized Chance's future as the future of hip-hop. When Chance declared the infamous line, I met Kanye West, now I'm never going to fail. I, I met, met Kanye, Kanye West, West now, now I'm never going, going to fail. fail. It was such a perfect quip, because how can you not say that? If you were this young man who just met his idol a couple years back, only to be plucked again and carried up in the air like freaking Simba in the opening track of one of his best albums ever. And you, my friend, get to help as well. Since then, he's gone on to feature for almost anyone with musical prominence, showcasing his immaculate tag team skills in each track. One highlight that truly expanded Chance's growing influence in the mainstream media was his appearance in DJ Khaled's 2017 single, I'm the One. While it wasn't the craziest, most over-the-top crossover ever, and with Chance still being able to deliver his signature performance, the hit certainly signified a huge step in how Chance has decided his career to go, from this beloved chi -town underdog to the sort of generic hip-hop type mogul that kind of underplayed some of Chance's unique and charming traits noticeably. Some of Chano's features would suffer from being a bit lackluster, compared to the end product of his first three mixtapes. But even then, the juke jam could not be stopped. In the midst of all this, Chance would also make a huge number of guest appearances all over TV, in comedy shows like SNL, Ellen, and James Corden, as well as taking a judging position in the Netflix reality series Rhythm Plus Flow. This shift from someone who wants to use an authentic, grassroots approach is what I think ate away at the cultural capital he once had that we previously discussed. Such decay and prominence would culminate with the release of his much-awaited debut album Big Day in 2019. Do I even have to explain how certifiably butt-cheek the album was? This album lacked no juice or jam whatsoever. Whatever warmth and comfort that the nostalgia of acid rap or the faith of coloring book provided was replaced with an air of invasive preachiness, and the result was a very clunky 77 minute and 10 second deformity. I mean for someone who once said that he doesn't make songs for free, he makes them for freedom, this has been Chance's most unexhilarating unliberating work so far. I mean, where's the guy that made same drugs? With Coloring Book, you had a winning formula of comfy gospel hip-hop that was fun, relatable, and had some complexity to it. But Big Day turned that formula into absolute gibberish. Not only were the overall thematics of the album so suburban, confusing, and alienating to his overall fanbase, it was clear that from performance-wise to penwork-wise, Chance just didn't reach the quality benchmark he used to set from his previous works. I actually remember a time when being a fan of Chance was something you could actually brag about, and I swear you wouldn't get clowned all over Twitter for it. The problem with Chance was that the more he gained mainstream attention, the more we saw the cigarette burns reveal themselves on the skin of his acid-washed armor, and how he was never really God's almighty gift to hip-hop in the first place. It did not help that China was continuing to buddy it up with Kanye during his very iffy presidential run, wherein Yeezy's focus on music shifted due in part of his political pursuits, as well as being a massively polarizing figure for previously displaying huge support for Donald Trump. Not to mention the fact that he also surrounded himself in his music with some very divisive figures in the industry, with the super extremity being R. Kelly in one hand and Justin Bieber in the other. It most certainly did not help even further that on top of all those controversies, he was having these spastic, holier than Taoisms and cynical tussles with random people all over Twitter. For a Christian man, he was pretty quick to wake up and choose violence. It couldn't be any less helpable when we all found out about the impending issues he had with his longtime manager Pat Corcoran and how he ignored all of his advice and instructions surrounding the continuing failure of the big album and tour. For this issue, I actually recommend a really good video by Volksgeist on Chance's fall. I was supposed to say in this conclusion that 
the downward spiral of Chance's career wasn't something to be celebrated at all. But then I remembered one thing. This guy is probably going to make more money today than I will in a month and a half. And maybe that's one of the contributing factors to Chance's fall in the first place. Maybe he was just complacent. Maybe he just stopped giving a flying ah! I mean, complacency is probably a real, actual thing among Hollywood elites, and I wouldn't be that surprised at all. I guess that's what happens when you make millions indefinitely. I will say though, as a college kid in 2016, Acid Rap and Coloring Book were some very influential pieces of music in my life, and I would very much like to see an inspired chance churn out something that comes even close to the quality and authenticity of those two mixtapes. Chance's stellar rise culminated with that famous steel line, and for me, it truly felt like the lyrical prophecy of the decade, where Kanye pretty much let Chance ring the bells that announced his status as heir to all of hip-hop. But as time between t Lop's release and the present grew longer, the more I saw that declaration less as a prophecy, and more as a loud whimper in the annals of hip-hop history. Perhaps Ultra Late Beam was just that biblical, I suppose. I don't personally have an opinion on Chancellor Bennett as a person based on what has been said about him. We know he's done great things, not only for Chicago, but for many of his listeners that experience a clear, positive influence in his music, despite what we may perceive as a drop in quality. This may simply be a case where no person, even if they have met Kanye West, is incapable of failure. I mean, just look at Designer. My answer to Chance's tirades on Twitter, however, would be that just because an artist incorporates his faith into his projects doesn't absolve him from any criticism or comment at all. Despite what the title suggests, I don't think Chance is hopeless at all either. There have been so many overhyped artists who've had multiple projects bomb, but were able to bounce back and make truly amazing and inspiring works of art. My diagnosis as a humble music fan is that Chance needs to incorporate his faith in his music without it coming off as invasive or alienating. He's gotta make amends with the people who help him get to where he is, and he has to find a way to rejuvenate his creative juice by perhaps taking an actual break and returning once he can create more mature works. If he can find the same love for nuance and self-expression that he once had, he should have all the ingredients to make another project that both he and his fans can truly be proud of. Surely we have all the reason to believe that the guy who was able to ride off the hype of his three free but amazing mixtapes, of all artists, could be the one to turn back around a career that's gone slightly sour, if maybe a little too acidic for our tastes. Maybe he can ask Justin Bieber on his resurgence mission back in 2015. But that's if he wants to though. I mean, he couldn't even listen to his manager when he needed him the most. Why would he listen to some dude with a trash sounding mic on YouTube, man? So do you think Chance still has a chance in hip hop's future? Or has Chance's chance slipped away? Do let us know, leave a like and a comment down below once you've had a chance. And we're kind of new to this YouTube thing, but we'll certainly take the chance to do our best in all our chances. Thank you and 